Well, good afternoon, everyone. I said last week that there was a first glimmer of good news with the expected arrival of the first small shipment of vaccines this week. Today, I'm here to confirm that the news is a lot bigger and it's a lot better. That first shipment of 3,900 doses of the Pfizer BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine arrived today. And it's been safely stored at the designated sites in Calgary and in Edmonton. We're taking the final steps to prepare, including hands-on training of staff to start immunizing healthcare professionals on Wednesday. As announced, we'll begin immunizing ICU doctors and nurses, respiratory th uh, therapists, and eligible continuing care staff in Edmonton and in Calgary. Now we chose these cities because that's where our case numbers are the highest and where our health system is facing the greatest challenges in terms of capacity. And we're going to give the system some real help in dealing with those challenges. Because this month we're not just doing these first 3,900 doses. I'm pleased to announce that we expect to receive another 25,350 doses of the Pfizer vaccine next week. That's about 29,000 doses, and they can all be first doses. We don't have to hold back any of that portion for the second dose. We're going to give the first dose of vaccine to 29,000 healthcare professionals by the end of December. Making this announcement is the greatest privilege that I've had as health minister, because it's the first real ray of light in the dark night that our healthcare professionals have lived through for 10 months now. I haven't walked in their shoes, but I've admired them my whole life, and never more than this past year. And I'm grateful and proud now to show them that we're here for them. Like other Albertans and people around the world, I saw the photo of Dr. Demer Marcille at the PLC in Calgary on his knees calling the family of a COVID patient who had passed away. That photo was a symbol of what everyone in our hospitals and every family doctor and many others are going through. And it's not over. These next few weeks are going to be the toughest yet, but relief is on the way and it's starting this week. I know that Dr. Demer Marcille and other healthcare professionals want the vaccine for their patients more than for themselves. And it will start getting, for the, uh, start getting to them very soon. But as with the first shipment, Pfizer is requiring that we administer these first 29,000 doses at the site of delivery. So we can't get it out to continuing care facilities yet, but very, very soon. For now, well, we've expanded the number of dedicated vaccine sites to eight so that we can expand this early phase to more healthcare professionals across the province. And with this strategy, we'll directly protect those providing care and also start to protect patients indirectly by reducing the risk of transmission from staff. Now, no vaccine is 100% effective, but vaccination means that doctors nurses and others can go to work with less fear of getting sick themselves or bringing COVID home to their families or exposing their patients without knowing it. And it will help the healthcare system meet the extraordinary challenge of adding new spaces to care for the very sick patients who are still coming into hospitals in larger numbers every day. Now, as we know, if these critical workers are exposed to COVID-19 or become ill. Their absence from the workforce is felt throughout the province. AHS has been busy contacting those eligible for this early distribution of vaccine and will continue reaching out to the expanded group to set up appointments for immunization. Thanks to the planning and the preparation of AHS, Alberta Health and the Vaccine Task Force, we're incredibly well prepared. We have the facilities, we have the equipment, and we have the people to safely and quickly receive, store, and administer these doses, including ultra-cold storage. And we're also expecting to receive the Moderna vaccine starting later in December. Now, I can't give firm numbers yet because we don't have them yet from the federal government. And in fact, this vaccine has not yet been approved by Health Canada. But we expect to receive a significant number of doses in December, 
and it won't require ultra cold storage. So we hope to get it to the first continuing care residents before December 31st. Now, this is another big step forward and we'll share more information as soon as we have it. We're getting these vaccines out as fast as humanly possible. But I have to emphasize, this is a process that will take months. And it's great to see that the numbers of daily cases seem to be finally flattening out. And along with it, the forecast growth of hospital admissions is coming down as well. But those are only the first signs of a change. And they'll only continue if we stay the course here in Alberta. If people look at the daily numbers or the news on vaccines and decide the crisis is passing, then we will cause a whole new crisis for ourselves, for our families, and for everyone working in the health system. We cannot manage COVID at the current level. We have to get cases and we have to get admissions down. We have to stay the course. We have to follow the restrictions that are in place and we have to protect ourselves and each other. I'll now invite Deputy Minister Winnick to provide details on the logistics of receiving and distributing the vaccine. Thank you, Minister, and good afternoon. As the Minister said, this is an exciting day for Alberta. Alberta Health, Alberta Health Services, and the COVID-19 Vaccine Task Force have been hard at work preparing for the vaccine doses arriving this week and next. I want to share some of the details about the process that we are following to make sure that those vaccines are tracked, stored, and used as quickly and as safely as possible. The doses must be carefully tracked and handled to ensure cold storage has been maintained throughout delivery, that there have been no breaks in that chain, and that the vaccines are safe for distribution. These are new vaccines, and so we need to ensure that Alberta Health Services staff have the specific training outlined by Pfizer for the safe handling and the administration of those vaccines. These first doses are being stored in ultra-cold freezers here in Edmonton and in Calgary. However, we are ready to start receiving, receiving them province-wide next week when the second shipment arrives. Alberta Health Services has already received and installed ultra-cold freezers at eight locations to store the Pfizer vaccine, and we have confirmed dry ice shipments for Alberta Health Services as well. We have eight more cold storage units arriving before the end of December, and an additional 20 scheduled to arrive in January. To prepare for the Moderna vaccine that Minister Shandro mentioned, seven units are expected by the end of December and an additional 16 will arrive in January. Alberta Health Services has all the other supplies needed to administer these vaccine doses for several months, so we are well positioned to ensure vac vaccinations go smoothly. If more vaccine becomes available, arrives earlier than expected, we will, as I like to say, be ready to roll. Alberta Health Services Public Health and Workplace Health and Safety Nurses will administer the early vaccine doses. And we are building on the success of the United Kingdom vaccine rollout and using their materials as a starting point for planning, in addition to all the training materials and information that we are receiving from the companies that manufacture the vaccines. We are truly, truly well prepared. Albertans can be confident that this vaccine is safe and that it will be administered efficiently without compromising quality. We have a dedicated multidisciplinary team from Alberta Health Services, Alberta Health and the COVID-19 Task Force. And we are all committed to getting the COVID-19 vaccine to our healthcare professionals and the most vulnerable Albertans as soon as possible. Our work is far from over, 
but I am confident in our efforts thus far. And I truly look forward to the weeks ahead as we start to take the steps that will end this pandemic. As I've said before, I do not look at these vac vaccines as objects to deliver or merely a simple task. These vaccines represent the start of our return to normalcy and the protection of our most vulnerable. Thank you. And I'd now like to uh, turn the podium over to Dr. Hinshaw to say a few words. Thank you, Minister and Deputy Winnick. And good morning, everyone. Today's announcement will be taking the place of my usual COVID-19 update. While I don't have all of the case numbers for you right now, I can say that we identified 1,887 cases yesterday and completed over 20,000 more tests for a positivity rate of greater than 8%. There are 716 people in hospital, including 136 admitted in the ICU. Sadly, another 15 deaths have been reported to us in the last 24 hours. My sympathies go out to all those grieving a loss today. As of yesterday, the reproduction rate, or R value, for the province over the last seven days was 0.98 in Edmonton zone, the R value was 1.0. In Calgary zone, it was 0.92. And in the rest of Alberta, it was 1.01. .01. So what does that mean? This metric of R describes whether the rate of transmission over the past week increased, decreased, or stayed the same. For example, if the R value is 1, then an infected person has infected about one other person on average. If it's above one, the spread grew. If it's below, then we saw a decrease. What last week's values seem to indicate is that cases plateaued over the week. This is certainly better than an increase, but as the minister mentioned, a plateau is not enough, and a single week's R value does not tell us about a trend. R is also not useful when looked at alone. We also need to look at our new daily case numbers, which remain high. What we need to achieve together is several weeks of an R value well below one, with a corresponding decrease in new case numbers. At present, even with this single week plateau, we are continuing to see growing hospitalizations and ICU admissions, which are straining our health system. We all must keep doing our part to limit in-person interactions whenever possible. Like everyone else, I'm pleased to hear that we're receiving a large supply of the Pfizer vaccine ahead of the original schedule. This is good news and a little bit of hope during a difficult time. As the minister announced, our vaccine distribution strategy focuses first on priority groups long-term care residents, and the critical workforce that cares for those in ICU and long-term care facilities. To be able to immunize residents of long-term care centers across the province, we need a vaccine that can be easily stored and transported to these facilities. We do not yet have the ability to do this onward transport from the sites that are receiving the initial shipments. That is why we're focusing our first doses on vaccinating crucial staff who work in hospitals and long-term care centers. This is with the goal to reduce the risk of transmission and outbreaks to those patients and residents who are at most vulnerable and most at risk of severe outcomes. To date, we have had more than 5,000 cases of COVID-19 in continuing care and acute care facilities across the province. Focusing immunization on workers from these areas first will have a great impact on protecting these facilities 
and those who live in or receive care in them. By immunizing healthcare workers first, we will also reduce one of the biggest stressors on our acute care health system today, staffing shortages. The isolation rules that apply to you and me also apply to healthcare workers. And all of us, including these workers, are at greater risk of exposure as our community transmission increases. This means when they are exposed to or contract the virus, they have to stay home until their isolation or quarantine period ends. Each time a worker has to do this, it leaves behind a critical position to fill in caring for patients or residents. This early vaccination of our healthcare staff will help protect both these workers and our system. It will help every Albertan access the care they need, whether it is related to COVID-19 or any other health issues. While this is exciting news, I do want to balance our excitement with the reality of the situation we're in today and will be in for months to come. The Pfizer vaccine requires two doses about one month apart to be fully effective. Worldwide demand for the vaccine is high and we will be receiving limited doses over the next few months. It will be some time before we are able to immunize the general population. We are still many months away from seeing widespread protection against COVID-19, which means the steps we are taking now to slow the spread and bend the curve are still critical. For the time being, we remain each other's vaccine and best defense. We have followed these measures for more than nine months now. In that time, we have shown that we are strong, adaptable, and courageous in a time of uncertainty. Together, we can and must continue to bend the curve and protect each other in the months ahead. Thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. Hi, I'm Steve Buick. Uh, we've uh, got a fair number of reporters in the queue, so I'll ask you to limit uh, to one question apiece, and we'll try to get everyone in who's waiting. Uh, so with that, operator, can we have the first question, please? The question comes from Don Braid of the Calgary Herald. Your line is open. Dr. Hinshaw, malls are required to uh, be 50% of fire code capacity, as, as are the stores inside of malls. Um, it, it certainly seems from evidence, uh, visual, and it's presented in various places, that the, um, uh, the malls themselves uh, don't look like they're running at 15% of their fire code capacity. The parking lots are full, photos from inside and so forth. Are you, are you concerned about that? And uh, what do you do to, to make big mall owners comply if that is indeed the case? Thank you for the question. And malls do need to comply with the 15% capacity cap, a 15% of fire code. So that would include all those who are inside the mall in both common areas and stores. And uh, the, there have been, as you say, reports over the weekend that I've heard. Now, um, it is important to note that the 15% capacity limit came into effect for Sunday. So Saturday would still have been 25%. And I would encourage those who are uh, witnessing these, these kinds of things, they can flag these issues with Alberta Health Services, Environmental Public Health, uh, and law enforcement. And we have increased the capacity of uh, peace officers to be able to issue tickets. But the important thing for us, we'll be following up on those reports this week, making sure that mall owners and operators understand their obligations and legal requirements and ensuring that they have systems in place to limit the number of people who are coming in. We also know that the, uh, the food courts in malls would have been able to operate on Saturday, but as of Sunday would be takeout only. So food courts in malls are no longer allowed to have eating spaces there. And again, that's something that uh, I'll take back to my team and make sure we're working with Alberta Health Services to ensure that mall owners are uh, all crystal clear if they aren't already about these requirements that they must follow. Thanks. Next question. The next question comes from Jesse Weisner of Global TV. The line is open. Hi, Dr. Hinshaw. Uh, you said the provinces are value for the province is currently at 0.98. Uh, what does that mean for Alberta and what do we still have to see in terms of case numbers coming down to in order to lift some restrictions? 
Uh, thank you, and um, I'll let uh, ask Dr. Hinshaw to answer the question, but before she does, just an update on uh, my, my earlier introduction, um, and just to show how dynamic the situation is with the, the manufacturer. The, uh, the first doses will be received by Pfizer uh, at the, the two sites where they will be administered um, in Calgary and Edmonton, will be received tomorrow. So with that, uh, Dr. Hinshaw, the, uh, the question regarding the R-value. We have been uh, focused on getting the R-value below one, which would mean that we would be seeing a decrease in the number of new daily cases every day. And of course, having an R-value provincially of 0.98 is encouraging because it means that over the last week, we plateaued. It means that uh, on average across the province, we did not have a growth of cases, but rather a, an even steady state. But as I said, what that means for the province is Although it's uh, an encouraging week's uh, number, it is not necessarily a trend. And what we need to see is an R value well below one. An R value of 0.98 is not sufficient to bring our case counts down. So we are looking to see an R value in the number that um, has been uh, spoken about publicly previously is uh, roughly 0.8, but we are um, working on a proposal to bring forward to the uh, COVID cabinet committee for the combination of both the R value and the number of, of new daily cases, because it has to be a combination of those metrics. It can't be one or the other alone that will tell us that we've been able to reduce the growth enough to protect our healthcare system. And you'll note from the numbers I shared earlier that we continue to see significant pressure on our hospitals and ICU. And the, that metric again of R essentially says, um, again, we didn't grow last week, but what we need to do is actually shrink our cases. And that's the challenge ahead of us. Thanks, next question. Our next question comes from Dean Bennett of the Canadian Press, your line is open. Thanks. Uh, question, I think, for Minister Shandro, and I'm sorry if I've missed this information before, but we talked about Pfizer and Moderna. What, uh, I mean, there's a lot of other companies that are trying to put these uh, doses out as well. I think Johnson Johnson, Novavax. Are we expecting to see those anytime soon? Should, should Albertans be expecting other, uh, other vaccines to be coming from other producers, or is that uh, not going to happen anytime soon? Well, uh, thanks, Dean. Uh, fantastic question. It is in the hands of Health Canada. Um, so we do, as uh, Alberta, expect, and, and as, as uh, Deputy Minister Winnick said, we're ready to roll. Um, so our, our job in the vaccine rollout would be to, to receive, to store, to distribute, and to administer those vaccines. And all parts of um, our, our role in it, we're ready for. We're ready to roll, as he said. Um, but when it comes to the approval of any of these candidates, uh, from Moderna, uh, Johnson and Johnson, and um, and the remainder of the the candidates, um, that that's up to Health Canada. I understand that um, some of them haven't uh, finished submitting all their paperwork yet to Health Canada, so it is in the hands to some extent of those manufacturers as well as Health Canada. Uh, but our for our part, in it we're we're ready for all of those candidates if and when they're they're approved by Health Canada. Oh, sorry. Just to add uh, to what the minister has mentioned is absolutely accurate, but I want to underline part of the, the process, which is what Health Canada goes through. Each vaccine, before it is licensed for use, must go through a rigorous series of trials and show evidence that it is both safe and effective. And so the, uh, the timelines that we are following are part of our commitment to Albertans as, as part of the work that we do with Health Canada that vaccines will be available only when they have gone through all of those regulatory requirements to make sure that we're only offering vaccines that have met all of those standards for safety and effectiveness. Thanks for that. So we'll go to the next question. Next question comes from Kevin Nimick of CTV. Your line is open. 
Hi there, this is a question for Dr. Henshaw, but uh, Minister Shandru may also want to weigh in. There are many conspiracy theories spreading about COVID-19, including claims about testing inaccuracy and flu cases misidentified as COVID. Many of these false theories target your leadership, Dr. Henshaw, and expertise in particular. How challenging is it to combat conspiracies, and why do you think some Albertans are prone to believing these things? The reality of COVID-19 is a difficult one. Uh, it's a one that requires all of us to do things that we're not used to doing, and it's one that requires all of us to make sacrifices. It's very tempting to believe that the information that is being shared uh, maybe is, is not accurate, uh, and that would make life easier uh, if that were the case. The unfortunate truth is that the COVID-19 diagnostics that we're doing and the COVID-19 impact on the system is exactly as we report it. We use tests that are uh, compatible with uh, worldwide standards and the influenza um, testing that we do is more, we have tested more samples for influenza this year than we typically do and yet we have not confirmed a single case of seasonal influenza in Alberta and the COVID-19 tests that have been done will only pick up COVID-19. So it is not accurate to confuse those two. Our labs have continued to test for all other respiratory viruses as they normally do, including influenza. And we're seeing that the measures that we have in place for COVID-19, not surprisingly, are helpful for other respiratory viruses as well. But because COVID-19 is a virus that none of us have pre-existing immunity to, it is having this very significant impact on our hospitals, on our ICUs, and of course with uh, those most tragic outcomes of the people who have died. And I guess what I would say to those who are tempted to look at some of those claims of the uh, information that we're sharing, um, having concerns about that, I would say that uh, it is my professional obligation, it is the training that I have and the experience that I have that stands behind me and all of my colleagues across the country and in fact around the world. Uh, we are all seeing the same challenge. Alberta is not unique and we are using all of the tools at our disposal to combat this threat to our population's health. I don't know, Minister, did you want to add? Thanks. We'll go to the next question. Our next question comes from Carly Robinson of City News, your line is open. Hi, this is either for uh, Dr. Hinshaw or Minister Shandro. Um, earlier, the minister said the next few weeks will be the most difficult, but there are some who say giving sports exemptions like the World Juniors send mixed messages to the public around health restrictions. How can you justify moving ahead with the tournament while our case numbers are still so high? I'll start with this question and then uh, if Minister Chandra wants to supplement uh, because the exemptions ultimately are, are exemptions that, that I sign when I look at safety protocols that are provided. We did see in the summer that we were able to allow the NHL tournament to proceed uh, and there was no risk to public safety of that tournament. I recognize that there are many, many people in this province who would like to be able to play sports right now. Uh, and at the same time, we also recognize that there are many, many people in the province who get great uh, joy and, and interest from being able to watch a uh, world-class competition such as the World Juniors. My team and I have worked with the organizers of the World Junior Hockey Tournament to make sure that their protocols are going to protect public safety, that they will be adequate to make sure that the uh, tournament can proceed in a safe way. And I've made the decision to allow them to proceed based on that rigorous evaluation. Thanks, we'll go to the next one. The next question comes from Julia Wong of Global News. Your line is open. Hi, this is a question for the minister and perhaps the deputy minister. You mentioned the Moderna vaccine hasn't been approved by Health Canada yet. So just curious how you came up with that timeline for vaccinating continuing care residents uh, before the end of December. And also, once that is approved, have certain facilities been prioritized to get that vaccine first? Yeah, thanks, Julia. Um, and it's... Uh 
the information that we've received from Health Canada and uh, when we expect, oh, that, and that's why we can't um, say publicly uh, and give some firm number or some firm date because still some of it is yet to be decided, but the, we're, we've started our planning because of the information that we've received from Health Canada and when we could expect to see an approval being uh, provided sometime this month and the amount uh, of vaccines that we could begin to provide, not just at uh, sites of in, um, a delivery, but also because it's not ultra cold storage, it doesn't have the same requirements as the, the Pfizer vaccine has that we can start being able to also distribute it to um, continuing care facilities. Um, now, the, the work is still being done uh, on which uh, care facilities uh, would be um, the first ones to, to be considered. And um, um, again, those, those are decisions to be made um, by the, the clinicians, depending on where we see the greatest concerns, the greatest risk to our uh, continuing care residents and the staff. So um, I don't know, Dr. Henshaw, if you'd like to add anything to that or no? Okay. Thanks, Julia. Uh, we'll go to the next one. Our next question comes from Heidi Pearson of Global News. Your line is open. Hi there. Uh, this is a question for the Deputy Minister, I believe, but perhaps uh, Minister Shandro can speak to it as well. Can you elaborate more on how the eligible healthcare workers are selected to get the vaccine if they want it? We've heard from a few ICU staff members who say some of their colleagues are getting calls to make an appointment, but others with the same job on the same unit um, have yet to be contacted and it appears to be kind of a random process with who actually gets the call. So how are you determining which of those eligible uh, employees are getting contacted and when? Sure, and, and I'll, I'll let Dr. Henshaw um, supplement, but this is the amazing and, and hard work that folks in AHS are doing to be able to make sure that there's distribution as quickly as possible. And um, knowing that uh, if, if this is the week that we receive it, to be able to start contacting people and making those appointments uh, through the booking system for Wednesday is amazing work. And it's a, a testament to how hard they're working to be able to contact the tens of thousands of healthcare staff who work in our ICUs in Edmonton and Calgary, um, the doctors, the nurses, the respiratory therapists. Um, it's it's uh, quite a bit of hard work. Um, and uh, so I thank AHS for being able to do it in such a timely way. Now, um, I'll ask Dr. Henshaw to supplement that though. Thank you, Minister. And I would agree that the uh, process has been implemented by Alberta Health Services and my understanding is that they have received lists of all those who work in intensive care units and all respiratory therapists and that individual phone calls are being made to those people who uh, are, are on that list. So if there are individuals who work in intensive care units in Edmonton and Calgary uh, or respiratory therapists in Edmonton and Calgary who haven't yet received a phone call, it would be important for them to speak to their manager and uh, make sure that they have their accurate contact information on that list because the intention is to offer uh, to those people who meet those criteria in those locations. Good. Thanks for that. Uh, next question. Our next question comes from Bill Fortier of TTV. Your line is open. Uh, hi there. Uh, We've heard in the past uh, from the federal government that the general public w would be looking at getting vaccines by the fall. Now, I'm just wondering, you keep saying it's going to be uh, quite a bit of time until the general public can get vaccinated, but we're seeing everything ahead of schedule. So these 29,000, you know, initially we weren't looking at getting any until January. Now we're going to have, you know, 29,000. Do you suspect that that this means that we'll be able to actually get to the general public sooner? Like, if you had to give a guess, would you say those vaccines start going out in the summer, or when are, when are we looking at? It's difficult to use the current experience as a predictor for what we'll see over the next uh, six to 12 months. That would be a best case scenario, that many of the vaccines would be available ahead of schedule. Uh, but that would be something that would be um, dangerous to, to count on. Uh, every single vaccine manufacturer has to go through that process of proving the safety and effectiveness of their vaccine through the trials that they're running. 
when that, those, those processes are complete, of course, then they need to move into the manufacturing to be able to manufacture many, many doses and, and ship all of those doses. So each one of those manufacturers is, is in that very complex process of research, the documentation, showing that evidence, getting the licensing, and then moving into that production and, and shipping. So while, of course, I think all of us hope that it might be possible to move ahead earlier than that schedule indicated, we can't count on that. What we need to do is make sure we're prepared in case that happens, but also make sure that uh, we don't ease off on the protection that we have to uh, give to each other in the meantime until we are able to make that offer and make that vaccine available to everyone. Because again, this isn't uh, unique to Canada or Alberta. This is the entire world who really needs access to these vaccines. Thanks. Uh, with that, we have just two reporters left in the queue, so we'll go ahead with just those two remaining. And uh, we're running a little long, but we'll try to get everyone in. So uh, next question, operator. Next question comes from Tom Ross of 660 News. Your line is open. Hi there. Um, we saw the UK health minister today talk about um, a possibly new strain of COVID-19 that is a bit harder to combat right now. So when we look at uh, this vaccine rollout, is there any concern that we might need a, a totally different vaccine by this time next year? And, uh, you know, is there anything the province can do to help prepare for this type of situation? We know with influenza, that particular virus, as you know, uh, does mutate quite quickly and we need annual influenza vaccines for that. With COVID-19, although there have been some shifts over time, so far, the bulk of the evidence that I've seen has not indicated that it has changed so dramatically from the initial strains uh, that the vaccine would not work. Of course, that's something we'll have to keep monitoring very closely and more information will become available as the vaccines roll out and as we continue to do the lab testing and analysis of the strains. But at this particular moment in time, the evidence that I've seen has not indicated that it changes as quickly or as much as influenza. Thanks for that, and we'll go to the last question. Our final question comes from Andrea Wu of Global Mail. Your line is open. Hi there. I'm wondering if any immunizations will be mandatory for any healthcare workers, and what happens if there are some workers who are hesitant or reluctant to at this time? Vaccination will be offered to all, but will not be required. So healthcare workers who do not wish to receive vaccine it's their choice, and there will be no sanctions against them. So that's it. We'll wrap up there. Thanks, everyone who joined us on the line. Thanks to all our guests.